there's no way to explain this nested hierarchy within the creationist worldview. Where does the line stop? If you're related to your dad by genomic comparison, why wouldn't you be re related to a chimp by that same metric if they use that, that method for mice and rats or uh, dogs and um, wolves, right? So. And uh, interestingly, the, yeah, we, oh. Oh, the difference between mice and rats is way bigger than humans and chimps. Way bigger, yeah. And, and most creationists accept mice and rats as being actually related through ancestry, but humans and chimps, no, that's a, that's a boat too far, despite the fact that they're radically more similar. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, it, it's, it's also funny that they're still producing literature this very year, which says there are no transitional fossils. Like, you can go to any of their, go to AIG, ICR, CMI, you will find an article written this year where they're still saying transitional fossils don't exist. It's, they're, they're talking out of both sides. Welcome everyone, and thank you all for coming to celebrate Darwin Day, or Charles Darwin's birthday, of which this would be the 211th. I'm Alex Bookbinder, president of the Secular Society of MIT, and it's my pleasure to introduce our speakers for this panel. Um, Erica graduated from the University of Arkansas in 2018 with a BSA in pre-professional animal science and with minors in anthropology and in biology. She has conducted observation and research on primates and other mammals in Tanzania and Thailand, and is currently finishing a master's of research at the University of Roehampton in primate biology, behavior, and conservation. Erica has been involved in the online discourse concerning evolutionary biology and its communication with an emphasis on human evolution for several years, both on Reddit and YouTube under the moniker Gutsick Gibbon. Timothy was born and grew up in Eastern Massachusetts and was raised as a young earth creationist. Although this was strongly pushed at the church he attended, it was not a big emphasis at home. In high school, he attended a local Catholic school that had no problems with evolution, and that, combined with a lot of time spent on talk origins, convinced him that evolution was indeed the cause of biodiversity, and that universal common ancestry was an accurate model of organisms. After high school, he joined the Navy and was a nuclear electrician aboard the aircraft carrier USS John C. Stennis. After six years, he left the Navy and attended the University of Massachusetts, earning a Bachelor of Arts in History with a minor in Renaissance and Medieval Studies. During this whole time, he remained an avid reader of literature about evolution and paleontology. He currently runs a YouTube channel as Dapper Dinosaur, dedicated to exposing the bad science and outright dishonesty of modern creationism. Jackson Wheat is a graduate student at Louisiana State University of Shreveport, and he has a bachelor's degree in organismal biology and has co-authored the book, The Rocks Were There, with RJ Downard. On his YouTube channel, he discusses topics in evolutionary biology and zoology, as well as sometimes combating creationism. These three wonderful people will share with us the best and worst of creationist arguments and how these can be countered. Please join me in welcoming Erica, Timothy, and Jackson. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, psyched to be here. Yeah, this is this is going to be really fun. I'm, uh, yeah, I, I know the other two guys here. We we roll in the same sciency gang on Twitter. So <laughs> excited. I I know I speak for all of us when I say we're we're psyched. All right. Shall we begin uh, with the. Uh... Uh, Erica, you want me to go first? Yeah, I can totally go first. Cool. Uh, yeah, sure though. Okay. Yeah, let me. Um. Okay, let me share my screen here. All right, share the old screen. Um. I think this should be good. Twitter. Ah, here we go. Cool. All right. So I'll do present and move myself over here. Let me make sure that works. Yeah, sure. Okay, cool. Um, awesome. Hello and happy Darwin Day. Thank you so much for having me here uh, and to Sohan for inviting me to um, help celebrate Charles Darwin, uh, who's behind perhaps one of the most important discoveries in all of biology, which is evolutionary theory. Um, so first a little bit about myself, but you know, I was going to kind of go through all this, but I, you guys already did. So that just gives me extra time to uh, to talk about other stuff. Um, one thing that, that was... Uh, <laughs> 
I, I wanted to kind of harp on here is, is dunking on creationism is, is, a, is a hobby of mine and I'm sure of the other panelists that, that are going to discuss today um, as well. That's, there's a picture of me at the uh, National Museum in London with Darwin. So that's a, a, that was a really cool, really cool experience getting to, getting to go there and see that. Um, now, everyone here today has probably had run-ins with young earth creationism or at least young earth creationists. You may like me have previously been one. But for those who may not know, these guys are evangelicals, usually Christians, who believe that everything, including humans, was specially created out of nothing some 6,000 to 10,000 years ago, which is, of course, insane. Now, we know that the Earth is very ancient. We know that it's around 4.5 to 4.8 billion years old by essentially every metric available. My favorite one to bring up is the fossil fuel industry, because to the tune of $257 billion annually, they rely on radiometric dating, um, which is, you know, outside of radiometric dating methods like isochron using cross corroboration amongst those different um, those different methodologies. You can also corroborate it with things like the movement of the tectonic plates of the Earth. Um, radiometric dating matches the rate at which we see seafloor spreading occurring in the uh, Mid-Atlantic Ridge. You can do it with dendrochronology. You can do it um, with with coral growth rates or ice cores, etc. Um, you know, all of this is quite funny to me because uh, creationists tend to invoke Noah's flood as this as this event that caused the rocks to simply look very old. Um, because it has to be responsible for the deposition of the entire geologic column in their mind. Um, but for that to be the case, then not only has accelerated decay had to occur, it's had to occur in stepwise with dozens of other independent methods, like the rate at which trees grow or how fast the continents are moving apart, um, which adds another layer of, of bonkers to the, to the whole thing. Um, but we also know, of course, that evolution is a fact, um, one of the most important facts, actually, of biology. Its primary prediction that populations of organisms will change over time thanks to the pressures of their environments is vindicated each and every day in our labs and in the wild places of the world, as well as through the annals of time in the geologic column. An understanding of evolution is imperative to human progression from medicine to conservation. Uh, it really truly is the foundation of, of all of biology. And I don't think that that's appreciated enough um, but you know, it certainly is the case. Now, young earth creationism is unfortunately still um, limping along despite the fact that numbers have been plummeting uh, for quite some time now. They're virtually non-existent in the scientific community. I, I think it's funny to talk to professors of mine uh, or, or colleagues because when they hear about what I do online, I tend to get responses like, wait, they still exist? Uh, in the same way that you might regard like a fax machine or a mall or other artifacts of a bygone age. Um, and yet 18%, that's nearly one in five adults, um, which, which is kind of blows my mind when, when you, know, you kind of think about it in, in that way, which means one in five adult humans is a self-hating ape. In my fields of study, which is primatology, young earth creationists are these apes with a horribly unwarranted case of severe self-loathing. They long so desperately to be apart from nature rather than accept that they are a part of it all for the sake of a particular interpretation of the Bible, one that isn't even interpreted with, or rather accepted or supported within uh, biblical scholarship, let alone by science. Their attempts at tackling human evolution tend to be characterized by uh, sheer incompetence, if nothing else, which we'll, we'll be kind of touching on here in a minute. Um, now we knew we were apes the moment we saw the skeletons of other apes. Uh, the father of taxonomy, Linnaeus, who was of course a creationist given the time that he lived, uh, he knew this, and he remarked on the conundrum that he was faced with. I really like this quote by him. He says, but I seek from you in the whole world a generic difference between man and simian that follows from the principles of natural history. I absolutely know of none. If only someone might tell me a single one, if I would have called a man a simian or vice versa, I would have brought together all the theologians against me. Perhaps I ought to have by virtue of the law of discipline. Um, he knew what we were from our dexterous ape hands to the ape teeth in our mouths. But when genetics came along, this, this whole thing was, uh, our heritage was betrayed you know, even further. Um, we share 98.8% of coding base pairs with genus Pan, so the chimps and the bonobos. And that's more than rats share with mice, which I think is, is stunning every time I, I kind of you know, mull it over. This number is achieved essentially by a full genomic comparison, which is fundamentally, it's just a souped up version of a paternity test, which is interesting because creationists will wholeheartedly accept the likes of paternity tests or genomic comparisons when comparing lions and tigers, which are also uh, separated by more differences than humans and chimps, coincidentally. Um, but once you get into are humans animals, are humans primates, they, they start having an issue. 
Uh, our genome is nested firmly within the primate order, though. Uh, no matter what we compare, we can do specific genes, we can do ERVs, we can do whole genomes. They all land us in the same place, which is a terminal branch of the hominid family tree, uh, which I think is awesome. <laughs> but they don't they don't think that very much. Um, they, they kind of uh, would object to that. Uh, and their objections have been very poor. So young Earth creationist researcher Jeffrey Tompkins of Answers in Genesis attempted to propose instead a 70% similarity uh, from his own methods, which he published in the Answers quote unquote research journal. Now his methods section allowed anyone to download the software that he used and kind of try to reach the conclusion by running the test themselves. Uh, and not only was he using a bugged version of the program, he used BLAST, uh, which Glenn Williamson at On Common Descent found, um, but using his parameters yielded a 75 to 88% similarity between two humans. Um, so Jeffrey Tomkins wasn't exactly the top brass <laughs> to be out there contesting the, the um, similarity between humans and the rest of the apes. Now, paleontology is one of my favorite things to discuss on this because creationists like to whine about paleontology quite a bit. Uh, the fossil record supports our common descent from the rest of the apes in spades. There are over 17 well-accepted hominins that span the 7 million years between us and Sahelanthropus chinensis, which is widely considered to be uh, the first of the split off between us and the Panins, so chips and bonobos. Uh, and they show a gradient of our change in just breathtaking detail. I love showing this picture to creationists, and to date, I've never had one able to draw the line between which of these are humans uh, and which are apes, because that's what they try to do. They look at the fossil record, they say, ah, it's all humans or it's all apes. But they can't draw the line. They, they don't even know where to begin. And that's exemplified when you show them this picture and say, where is it? Uh, but it's also exemplified by what they've said. This is a fun chart. Uh, I believe I pulled this from Talk Origins of a bunch of creationists trying to decide which hominins are ape and which are humans. Uh, and they can't agree because there exists no set of criteria that can distinguish them uh, because we are apes. That would be like trying to distinguish humans from mammals, which is, of course, not doable. Uh, but Wow, the fossil record is impeccable. We can see everything that separates us from chimps from our shared common ancestor in full display in change through time, right, through through the geologic column. We see the emergence of bipedal locomotion in early, uh, very early in, in our line in Sahelanthropus chidensis and Aurora and Tugenensis, as well as Artopithecus ramidus, uh, which you can see over here on the left, and on the right is uh, Australopithecus sediba. You can see how they're very clearly bipedal, unlike what would be on display at, say, the Creation Museum in Kentucky, uh, from their bowl-shaped pelvis, which helps hold all their organs and um, strengthen the pelvic floor, to the angle of their knees that help them hold their weight directly above the body. Uh, the location of the foramen magnum, or the hole at the base of the skull, is ventral, underneath the skull, so it can sit on top, like, a, like at the tip top of a totem pole, rather than out the back for a, a, a knuckle walker. The, these guys were bipeds very early on, much, much before they, they got big brains, interestingly enough. Uh, the Australopithecines, too, they display a reduction in the canine teeth. They show an increase in brain size, brain case size, rather, um, more efficient bipedality in the case of where their halix is directed and a flattening muzzle. The early members of HOMO continue these trends uh, with late HOMO really seeing it in full with the emergence of uh, fire usage and complex tools. Now, it's funny to me because creationists like to propose uh, that hoaxes, like the Piltdown Man, uh, completely invalidate the jaw-dropping lineage that you that you just saw. Um, and they neglect to point out that it was anthropologists that discovered the Piltdown Man was indeed a hoax, same with Nebraska Man. Um, but <laughs> they really conveniently ignore all of the hoaxes of biblical antiquity. If a single hoax in paleontology or in uh, paleoanthropology violates the entire field, then biblical scholarship has a, has a huge problem. They'll also point to the dumpster fire that is contested bones, which is brought up a lot by modern YouTuber creationists. Uh, this is a book that was written by young earth creationists with absolutely zero relevant credentials. It manages to get even the basics wrong, mixing up robust and gracile australopithecines uh, seen there below consistently throughout the book. And it's not a thin book. Now, the, the authors, of course, are uh, plant geneticist John Sanford and this dude, Christopher Roop, who, who has a bachelor's and, I, I, to my knowledge, has not published anything. Um, they, 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 really, uh, they really, again, are always bringing the top brass with these, with these guys. In the modern age, it's, just, it's all recycled arguments. And when you, when you by chance stumble across something new, uh, it's, it's very easily dissectable thanks to, to the modern age of information.
But we don't just look like monkeys, we act like them too. I tend to balk when people point out how like us other apes and monkeys are, because we're a single species on this long chain of social animals, simply continuing the behaviors that are conducive to social cohesion and well-being. Uh, our cousins laugh when they're tickled, they grieve when a loved one dies, they engage in politics and go to war, they pass down culture and innovate with tools. Other apes have sex for fun, they understand fairness and feel emotions like disgust, guilt, and shame. They can be sympathetic, vengeful, charismatic, or tyrannical. Uh, and th this is just a couple of pictures that I find really exemplify that well. That's an infant gorilla and a human both uh, shuddering at the same cold feeling of a, of a stethoscope because we share most of our facial expressions with them. Our facial expressions tend to mean the same things. Uh, at the upper left, that's two chimps consoling one another. That's specifically, I believe, a, 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 an adult female consoling a male who's just lost a fight. He was trying to overturn the alpha. Uh, at the top right, that's that's a, a submission gesture, holding out the, the palm towards the sky. Um, and on the bottom left, that's an orangutan, and she she is attempting uh, to, to poke at the fish under the water from, from observing local humans doing the same thing. To my knowledge, she was not successful, but it's still very jarring uh, to see. That's an orangutan laughing when they're tickled. Um, of course, humans can teach chimps sign language, and sometimes they'll teach it to each other. Uh, that bottom left picture is, uh, I'm sure everyone here has seen uh, a, a human child walk up and mess with their parent. And that's, of course, what, what chimps do as well. Um, all apes, really, because we're, we're all family and we come from the same, from the same stock. And our most distant ancestors display to what was once thought to be unique to humans alone. Gelatas, that's a gelata baboon, even though they're not technically baboons, at that upper left, they have vocalizations that follow our linguistic laws. So when we record their vocalizations, they follow uh, laws of efficiency, Zips and Menzraff's law. That Campbell's monkey at the upper right uh, is from a species that utilizes syntax and grammar, so they can adapt calls to mean different things depending on the context. And um, of course, there's a, a baby human and a baby chimp because we share 96% or more of our gestural repertoire, uh, which is very interesting uh, to say the least. And this is something that seems very intuitive. Uh, so, so what then makes us unique from other apes? Robert Sapolsky argued that it was our ability to tell stories and empathize across space, time, and reality. We can feel sad for a person who lived 2000 years ago, and we can even feel sad for a fictional character. That simply makes us storytelling apes. Now I could wax poetically for <laughs> hours about how every single field in science definitively precludes young earth creationism from geology to physics, astronomy and genetics. And this is all true, but we need go no further than the empirical fact that we're not specially created beings formed from the dirt 6,000 years ago but bipedal tool using virtually naked apes that descend from a long line of other apes, monkeys, mammals, and animals all the way back through hundreds of millions of years. We're intelligent, we're empathetic, distance running animals who have a knack for throwing and telling tales around the fire. We are impeccably social and very special, but so is every other animal. So thank you so much for hearing me out. Uh, and if you wanna hear more about how cool it is to be a gentle and modern ape or how bonkers young earth creationism is, uh, you can check out my YouTube channel, which is Gutsick Gibbon. So thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Erica. Um, and uh, up next is uh, Dapper Dino, who's gonna be uh, continuing. Uh, Go ahead. All right. Well, first, I have to say that it is an honor to be asked to speak with you today. I was certainly not expecting such a generous offer. Uh, so I'm sort of the dinosaur of the group of us three. And so I'll talk about that, specifically the history and current state of creationist research and thinking on dinosaurs. Creationist thought on dinosaurs has varied considerably over the years. The first take on dinosaurs by creationists is that by uh, progressive creationists, which in fact was the take of the inventor of the term dinosaurs, namely Sir Richard Owen. He believed in what's called progressive creation. This position accepts the physical evidence of the old earth, but claims that various ecosystems we see in the fossil record, which show us the reality of faunal succession, were individually created by God, only to then be wiped out by him and replaced by a new system of organisms. So for him, dinosaurs were the pinnacle of the age of reptiles, but God replaced them with the, of course, obviously, more noble, smarter, and faster mammals. Richard Owen, <clears throat> sorry, Richard Owen was an ardent opponent of Darwin's ideas, but ultimately his position was abandoned both in science 
and by most of creationist Christianity. Today, progressive creation is all but unheard of among anti-evolutionists. Uh, some of the earliest creationists, especially the less educated ones, said that dinosaurs were simply either a hoax or were invented by Satan to test the faith of Christians. I'm not really sure what to say about this, except that other than probable pose, this trend has not lasted, and no one in the major creationist organizations have much time for that position. The next position that can really be found is that dinosaurs drowned in the flood, that being Noah's flood. This is in line with books like Flood Geology, which credits the flood with all Paleozoic and Mesozoic rocks. And while it's ambiguous, Flood Geology tends to see at least some Cenozoic rock as being post-flood. So at first, this would seem like as reasonable a position as one could have while ignoring all the things about this flood story that make the flood absolutely physically impossible. But then major creationists like Kent Hovind and Ken Ham notice something. The Bible seems to require that Noah take dinosaurs on the ark as they are living creatures with nostrils. And those are the criteria given in Genesis for creatures on the ark. So then there must have been dinosaurs on the ark. Generally, this is addressed by pretending that a taxonomic family is rather than being an arbitrarily sized taxon, some reflection of the actual creation of life by God, called a kind in English, or a mean in Hebrew, which is where they get that from. Then they say that only two representatives of each dinosaur family needed to be brought along, and further they posit that Noah brought juvenile animals rather than adults, ignoring, of course, that many dinosaurs would need the socialization with conspecifics that their parents would give them in order to know how to interact with other dinosaurs. Of course, this raises the problem of there being no evidence of humans living with non-avian dinosaurs. To answer this objection, creationists have simply decided that the dragons of mythology and the behemoth of the Bible are dinosaurs, despite neither actually looking or acting much like dinosaurs in the actual descriptions and art of them. They are also quick to use a combination of flat dishonesty and pareidolia to interpret ancient and medieval art as dinosaurs. Even when the animals in question <laughs> resemble no identifiable dinosaur, and are either chimerical or clearly mammalian, such as the dragons of the Asher Gate or the long-necked lions of the Egyptian Old Kingdom. In recent years, however, creationists have been fighting about whether any dinosaurs had feathers and whether birds are dinosaurs. You see, the problem is that around the same time that creationists were trying to convince each other that dinosaurs were on the Ark, then became the dragons of legend, then died out all without leaving a shred of physical evidence, they also decided that birds and dinosaurs were completely separate things. And it's easy to see why they made this decision. If birds are in fact dinosaurs, and birds can be so different from, say, a triceratops, then it seems to uh, sorry, it seems to be hard to see why they shouldn't have also evolved from bird-like, but not quite bird dinosaurs. Around this time, they latched onto the work of paleoornithologist Dr. Alan Fiducia, who at this point in time is basically ignored by mainstream science, because none of his arguments that birds are not dinosaurs but are instead pseudosuchians have been borne out. Still though, you'll see modern creationists trot out his tired claim that what are obviously feathers and protofeathers and, and dinosaur fossils are in fact collagen fibers, despite the presence of melanosomes in such, which you cannot find in collagen, but you can find in feathers. Or they'll trot out the argument that whole swaths of what are uncontroversially known to be non-bird dinosaurs weren't dinosaurs at all and were instead flightless birds that just happened to look like dinosaurs. This would include animals like Velociraptor, Oviraptor, and perhaps even Therizinosaurus. Of course, there is disagreement even here. Just this past year, in 2020, in sequential live streams from Answers in Genesis, David Menton, DDS, claimed that Velociraptor was a bird, while Buddy Davis claimed that it was obviously a scaly dinosaur with no connection to birds. And of course, all of these, as well as creationists like Jonathan Sarfati and Kent Hovind, seem to be barely able to discern the first thing about bird anatomy, or in some cases, such as Kent Hovind, even broader dinosaur anatomy. For example, Kent Hovind admitted to me in debate that he could not identify a dinosaur skeleton as such if presented with one. And I would like to remind you, this is a man who has called himself Dr. Dino for decades, and he had never even thought to look up what a dinosaur was in the first place. So that's kind of the standard creationists have been setting lately. Um, <clears throat> uh, and Sar Jonathan Sarfati, who I mentioned earlier, challenged people in a live stream to find any animal with both an open acetabulum and feathers. An open acetabulum means that the hole in the hip where the femur sockets into the hip is just an open ring of bone instead of a closed socket like it is in most animals. 
I was then asked to identify such an animal directly by some creationists who had just left a creationist live stream while I was live on my channel. Of course, my answer was simply that every bird in the world is an animal with an open acetabulum and feathers. But it should also be noted that many non-birds, such as Anchiornis, Microraptor, and Oviraptor, are also undoubtedly in this category of animals with an open acetabulum and that bore feathers. <clears throat> and now I want to talk about the strange one-sided love affair that current creationists have with the work of Dr. Mary Schweitzer. Dr. Schweitzer is a Christian paleontologist and in no way a young earth creationist. She in fact was a young earth creationist when she started her education to become a paleontologist, but she was quickly convinced of the great age of the earth and the evident truth of biological evolution. She famously reported finding osteocytes, collagen, and structures physiologically similar to red blood cells and blood vessels in Tyrannosaurus rex bone. Now her work is not without controversy, but creationists have latched onto it as evidence of the young age of fossils, ignoring of course that even assuming that the finds are as Dr. Schweitzer claims, our options are to either reconsider if some organic molecules can last longer than we thought, or on the other hand, to reconsider all of geology, biology, astronomy, cosmology, chemistry, relativity, and quantum mechanics. I think we can all see which of these two options we might go for first. And of course, Dr. Schweitzer herself has proposed mechanisms by which such tissue and molecules could be preserved, usually involving high iron, high iron concentrations in the minerals which seep into the fossil. A quick point I want to make here, if it has not already been made, is that sometimes when talking about paleontology to creationists, you'll hear someone call the consensus paleontology community, quote, paleo experts. Use of this term automatically means the person you're talking to has a roughly 95% chance of knowing absolutely nothing about paleontology. The term itself is derived from the book Contested Bones, which we already heard about, which is basically just a creationist bungling of human evolution. Of course, I've left that topic largely to gut sick given. But this use of strange creationist jargon, as well as misuse of real scientific jargon, is typical of the current crop of YouTube creationists. They are typically not professionals, but they will sometimes have interviews or talks with professional creationists. They're what I like to call junk, uh, jargon junkies. They know how to pronounce but not really use a lot of big scientific terms, and they use this to seem both smart to their audience of fellow creationists, but also to those who are not creationists but are not terribly well informed on the topic in question. Of course, when they try to pull this tactic on someone who actually does know the subject, their use of jargon comes off as nearly incomprehensible gibberish. These are people who will wax lyrical about DNA methylation targets and RNA self-catalysis, but who think both that birds are dinosaurs and that no dinosaurs had feathers, or that ribose is a protein, or that an animal didn't have molars despite showing pictures of the molars in their own article, or who don't know what a carbohydrate is, or that there is such a, or who think that there is such a bone as a tibula. The last example I want to bring up of recent creationist bungling dinosaur research is Mark Armitage and his alleged sheets of macroscopic scale soft tissue from an alleged Triceratops horridus horn. Let's start at the beginning of his bad methods and work our way forward. First, he did not clearly identify the location of the find, making the whole endeavor useless from the get-go. He didn't take insufficient, or sorry, he took, he didn't take sufficient in situ photographs of the horn. He didn't do any analysis to actually show that it was really a triceratops horn and not a bison latifrons horn. Horns, which can be found in the approximate area he claims to have gotten his. And of course, those two species have been confused even by experts. In fact, when the holotype specimen of T. horridus was found, it was initially identified as a pair of B. latifrons horns. Armitage also claimed to have found a parcel vertebra and rib. There are insufficient pictures of these, but I did find some footage of him on site with the rib and it is more consistent with a bison rib than a triceratops rib, especially in cross section. He took insufficient pictures after getting the horn to the lab, but what, uh, but what pictures he did have, have evident modern organic contamination, including infiltration of the fossil by plant roots. And finally, of course, he published in a structural biology journal, not a paleontology journal, because they wouldn't know enough to properly peer review his work. So that's the state of modern creationism with regards to dinosaurs. They can't agree if, on, uh, they can't agree if dinosaurs had feathers, whether the birds are dinosaurs, they can't tell the difference between collagen and feathers, they think the dragons were dinosaurs, and when they try to do research on dinosaurs, 
They can't even get the first thing right about methods. In short, creationists are as inept at paleontology as flat earthers are at geography, because that's all young earth creationism is. It's flat earth with better geography. Thank you again for having me. I hope you enjoy this quick overview of the history and current state of creationist research on dinosaurs. And if you want to hear more, of course, my YouTube channel is available where I have usually two to three uploads a week. All right. Thank you very much, Timothy. Uh, and uh, last but not least, we have um, Jackson Wheat to present. Please welcome Jackson. Okay. Can everyone hear me all right? Uh, yeah, I can hear you. Uh, I can hear you. Okay. <clears throat> well, hello everyone and thank you for having me. My name is Jackson Wheat. I'm a master's student in organismal biology at Louisiana State University of Shreveport. I love Darwin Day. I love that we have a holiday which is devoted to one of the two fathers of evolutionary biology. Darwin revolutionized a variety of fields from zoology to botany to biogeography to paleontology to geology. He's even been credited with influencing physics. As Austrian physicist Ludwig Boltzmann said in 1886, quote, if you ask me about my innermost conviction, whether our century will be called the century of iron or the century of steam or electricity, I will answer without hesitation. It will be called the century of the mechanical view of nature, the century of Darwin, close quote. As we all know, Darwin brought the realm of nature into the clear light of scientific investigation and his revolutionary idea was natural selection, the process by which the design of nature could be explained without a designer. Though natural selection is no longer seen as the only mechanism of evolution, it is still very much an important one. Natural selection explains a huge and ever-growing body of biological facts. It is one of the processes that shapes populations of organisms into new species. As new mutations arise, as organisms push into new territories and are affected by new environmental pressures, natural selection hones populations for their niches. This is non-controversial in modern biology, and even creationists usually accept this. Answers in Genesis, the Institute for Creation Research, and Creation Ministries International all happily, or begrudgingly, affirm the existence of natural selection, though they do not explain to what extent they believe this process to occur. Can natural selection be responsible for minor genetic variations changing in frequency in a population? Can natural selection drive the divergence of one species into two? Top-tier creationists, such as Georgia Purdom, Todd Wood, and Kurt Wise, would answer yes to these questions. But can mutations and natural selection cause great genetic and morphological changes in populations? Well, that depends. Great is subjective. What do you consider a great difference? Is the difference between darkling and stag beetles great? Is the difference between humans and chimps, giraffes and ocopes, lungfish and coelacanths, geckos and iguanas, cup fungi and sac fungi, ginkgos and conifers, or cyanobacteria and purple bacteria? How far can mutations and natural selection drive populations to change? Can sexual selection change populations? What about genetic drift, horizontal gene transfer, endosymbiosis, heterochrony? Do creationists even recognize that these processes occur? If creationists do recognize that these processes occur, how far can they drive changes in populations? Is the green peafowl, Pavo muticus, related to the Indian peafowl, Pavo cristatus? even though the green peacock doesn't have a gigantic tail train like the Indian peacock. Is the flagellated protist Polynella related to any other flagellated protists, even though Polynella underwent a separate endosymbiotic event with a cyanobacterium? Are barnacles related to crabs since both have near identical larvae? This comes to the question of how many organisms are related to each other. Aaron Ra calls this the phylogeny challenge. Charles Darwin applied the phylogeny challenge to the organisms he studied. Giant ground sloths and modern sloths, glyptodonts and armadillos, Galapagos and South American tanagers, rheas, the wara, barnacles, and others, and inevitably came to the conclusion that all of life is in fact related. 
In chapter two of On the Origin of Species, Darwin remarks, quote, Many years ago, when comparing and seeing others compare the birds from the separate islands of the Galapagos archipelago, both one with another and with those from the American mainland, I was much struck how entirely vague and arbitrary is the distinction between species and varieties. Close quote. Further, Darwin argues, quote, certainly no clear line of demarcation has as yet been drawn between species and subspecies. That is, the forms which, in the opinion of some naturalists, come very near to, but do not quite arrive at, the rank of species, or again, between subspecies and well-marked varieties, or between lesser varieties and individual differences. These differences blend into each other in an insensible series, and a series impresses the mind with the idea of an actual passage. Close quote. Darwin killed the Linnaean concept of species immutability in origin and continued to apply this line of reasoning. If all the Galapagos tanagers are related to each other, and the South American tanagers are related to each other and to the Galapagos tanagers, are these tanagers related to all other tanagers? Darwin answered yes. He further answered yes as to whether all barnacles are related, all pigeons, all orchids, all earthworms, all life. There is no way to separate the relatedness of organisms except by our own arbitrary taxonomic ranks. All life is related, and this fact is reinforced by every field of biology. Here was Darwin's evidence. Organisms change over distance. The waras of the eastern Falkland Islands have slightly different coats compared to the waras of the western Falkland Islands. Organisms change over time. The barnacle, Scalpella arcuatum, is slightly different from the start of the Cretaceous to the end. Limited resources exist in an environment, but populations overproduce offspring. Every individual has variations, and that these can be inherited open the door for natural selection to act. Darwin melded each of these ideas to, to conclude that the variations make organisms better or worse at existing in a particular environment, and that the selection of variations in populations gradually change the morphology of organisms over time. The fact that the genetic composition of organisms changes over time, resulting in new morphologies, is obvious from both field observations and laboratory experiments. And Satina salamanders have radiated in two directions around California, resulting in a blotched and unblotched coloration. Haplochromine cichlids have adapted their jaw morphology and color scheme in Lake Victoria. Frogs and finches differentiate each other by their uniquely pitched calls. Bacteria develop new physiological functions in test tubes and petri dishes, and there are countless others. Theodosius Dobzhansky famously said that nothing in biology makes sense except in light of evolution, and he was right. Though the structure of evolutionary theory is no longer as simple as natural selection and gradualism, evolution is still the theory that underlies all biology. The body of facts supporting it have made creationism into a paltry alternative, hence why it only exists in the annals of YouTube at this point. This is why evolution is true. It's the greatest show on earth, and we have much to learn from our ancestors' tales, as both the current and past world has been filled with endless forms, most beautiful, truly wonderful life. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jackson. Uh, and now, okay. okay, I'd like to ask uh, Dapo and Erica to return to to the video. Yeah, I am back. Okay, great. Uh, and okay, great. So we'll take some questions. Um, just just to let everyone know the the program. Uh, I'll, uh, we have a few seed questions, and then we have uh, we'll take questions from the audience, and then we also have. By the way, the uh, uh, Randy Olson, who was uh, who made the film Flock of Dodos and was our first uh, Darwin Day, like he made that film and he was a panelist there as well. Uh, he sent us uh, a deleted scene from the film, which oh. he said we could, uh, which said we could screen. So 
we'll, we'll screen that scene at the end of the film. I don't know if uh, have any of you seen the film. I have not. No. I haven't either. Okay. <coughs> well, um, yeah, it's, it's a it's a very interesting film. Uh, I mean, the, the the cliff itself is a bit. Uh, well, it, it's it's a bit sobering, but <laughs> um, but yeah, it, it, it'll be interesting. Um, cool. Anyway, I'll screen that towards the end, and then uh, after the after the formal close of the event, uh, I'll stop recording, and then whoever would like to hang out, you know, stay on afterwards, and uh, for a more casual, open discussion. Um, right. So, so I wanted to actually ask. Uh, we got we got a nice overview here. So we got like the. Uh, the 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 apes the uh, I mean the 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 apes primates etc and then the dinosaurs and um, like about genes and everything and uh, that's, that's like pretty much I think like covers most of the bases. Um, I want to ask about like the one of the recent events. Uh, there was from one of the institute one of the one of the apologists asked about uh, why couldn't uh, some being just intervene at different points in evolutionary history and uh, and, th and thereby kind of uh, get over these these low probabilities they were claiming um, you know in, in, in mutation rates and things like that so uh, would anyone any of you like to address that I mean I, I certainly have a few things to say one is I mean, I guess you can't completely rule out the possibility of some intelligent agent doing that, but in order to do so and have that idea be taken seriously, one, you need to make some falsifiable predictions, which I've never heard any of. Uh, and two, you need to propose some at least plausible mechanism that is based on some established scientific like physics or chemistry or something. Um, and two, I don't actually think that the probabilities are as low as most uh, creationists would like us to believe. I don't think that we can realistically assess most of the probabilities until we have a solid model of abiogenesis in the case of the formation of the first life. And in the case of mutations, we already know the probabilities just aren't very bad. Mutations occur regularly and a decent percentage of them are favorable for the organism in its environment. So now you could say the chances of a particular mutation happening at a particular point in time is low, but there is a whole host of mutations that could potentially be beneficial and any one of them happening is not particularly unlikely. So it's sort of the, the Texas sharpshooter fallacy. Oh, you know, this particular beneficial mutation was so low that it, it, we, we can't expect it to have happened. It's like, okay, right, but a beneficial mutation was likely to happen at some point and you painting a bullseye around this one doesn't really change that fact. I think too that a, lo a lot of the problem with these uh, creating these wild statistics comes from generating. Um, so what are the odds that you could generate the entire human genome from random chance? Um, and th and they apply these creationists do um, or creationist apologists do without invoking any kind of selection or rather accounting for any kind of selection whatsoever. It's just rolling the dice, and that is so far from what nature actually involves and, and what we observe, uh, that, that it's not even really worth discussing. It's, you know, if you hear a creationist bring up statistics, you know, the, the first question is, okay, uh, where did these statistics come from? And you track it down and you find out almost every single time uh, selection isn't being accounted for. Uh, and the other thing is a great many of these uh, complex mutations or structures, whatever, um, they, they actually just they're precursors. It's building on a precursor that already existed. Um, so that's all I have to say. <laughs> um, I suppose I could add that <clears throat> actually uh, to that point. Yeah, there, uh, there are like every, uh -oh. I think we might've lost Jackson. A touch. Jackson, you there? Did we lose him? F in the chat for Jackson. F in the chat for Jackson. Uh oh, am I here? Can you hear oh, me? I can hear you. <laughs> He's returned. Jackson, you there? Maybe. Maybe. He's can you hear me? I can hear you. <laughs> can you hear us? 
Jackson. Jackson, are you there? I can't see your video though. Jackson, blink once for yes, and twice for no. Can you hear us? <laughs> Maybe we we can try the next question while we see if Jackson can can get back in. Okay. Um, so just like questions about stuff, you know, I've heard on campus, you know, various apologists come to MIT and 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 try the, uh, um, you know, their lines and everything. And one of them is uh, chirality. I'm sure you've heard of this objection. Mm -hmm. uh, as I understand it, it's like a molecule has a particular like left-handedness and right-handedness, and yeah. And, and uh, another related one is uh, diffusion. Like there are certain concentrations of of chemicals that are required that are alleged to be required for for uh, life to exist. And in a in like a vast ocean, like anything that just forms will will just diffuse out into into the into the greater ocean and won't be available in certain concentrations that are required. So would you uh, address these? And then, by the way, if, if anyone else has questions, please post uh, them in the in the chat with a with the word question and then colon and then let's, so so we know that's a question for uh, for, the, for the panelists. If you have a question okay. for a particular panelist, then then. Do we lose another one? Oh no. I'm sure that I'm sure Kent Hoven is using his leets hacker skills. Yeah, yeah, Kent, I'm in. <laughs> <laughs> um, so with, with regards to uh, homo chirality, I will say that that is largely an open question in uh, abiogenesis research. We don't have one thing to support remember is we do not have a good um, theory of abiogenesis. All of the current hypotheses regarding abiogenesis are currently very tentative, but we are making progress there. And um, there are a number of proposed solutions to the homo chirality problem, uh, which is basically, <clears throat> if you look at like say left, your left and right hand, right? They have essentially the same structure, but they're not identical. They're mirror images of each other. And amino acids have the same thing where you can have essentially a chemically identical amino acid, but it's a mirror version of it. And life on earth has used, as far as I know, always and uh, universally, all left-handed amino acids. Um, and one possibility might just simply be that <clears throat> because it's a life form tends to need to use one um, handedness or another, that simply the ones who were using the left-handed amino acids ended up winning out. And also that it could be that as very early life was starting to generate more amino acids, that the ones that because they had started out perhaps simply by chance using left-handed as opposed to right-handed, that them themselves creating more and more left-handed was simply amplifying the essentially the chemical signal of left-handedness and the pool of amino acids kind of in the entire environment, allowing other organisms per, who perhaps were switching back and forth or per, trying to use both ended up being heavily selected for using left-handed, which is another option. Um, as far as the concentrations, um, like everything in abiogenesis, there was still a lot of questions, but we have a lot of options for things like, um, you know, uh, drying tide pools and, you know, as water evaporates out, the concentration of other chemicals has to go up by, you know, the definition of concentration, right? You have less parts of water, you have more parts of other chemicals per water. And we also have things like, um, you can form hypercycles out of things like lipid bilayers, which form naturally. And because they're semi-permeable on their own, they can start to concentrate chemicals inside of them. So that can also be a thing that helps with this uh, problem of getting the important prebiotic chemicals in sufficient concentrations. But again, we, it's an open question. We, there is no scientist who is going to say, or at least no honest scientist who would say, I know exactly how the first life form formed, formed on earth. And this is the precise way it happened. Earlier today, I actually watched um, a, a video. Oh, I, I'm forgetting, I'm forgetting the name of the, of the, of the doctor who was giving it. Um, Deidrum, I think, I, I, I forget. He, he was essentially, he's an astrobiologist and, and he was essentially covering this idea that it's like, we won't ever know how life did form because we, we can't go back in time, right? We, we don't have any fossils to snapshot that exact moment. Um, but we can find out how it may have formed and we can do so in several different ways. Uh, essentially plugging in the prebiotic conditions, the conditions of prebiotic earth and, and seeing what hashes out when, when we run simulations and things like that. 
uh, which would effectively, quote unquote, solve uh, the, the abiogenesis, quote unquote, problem. I think that creationists very often, and I'm sure you experience, you guys experience this there at MIT, uh, apologists, they paint abiogenesis as this unsurmountable hurdle uh, that's in, the, in its death throes. Like, it, this is not even remotely the case. It, it, origins of life research is, th it's booming, it's thriving. You, you could sit down and uh, begin reading abiogenesis papers just from the previous years, origin of life papers just from this past year, uh, and it would take you probably the entirety of this year. It, there's, there's just so much out there being done uh, because everyone is specializing in a different area. So this, this is, yes, an unanswered question, but it's only unanswered in the same way that we might uh, question how one lineage uh, diversified and, and gave rise to another. Um, it's, it's this idea that it's like, it, there's quite a bit of support. The, the question is, what are the details? Um, so, so I would, I would argue that, you know, when you're, when you're confronted with things like that and the homo, homo chirality problem, quote unquote, I, I've heard many times as well. And it's been a long time since I've actually sat down and, and looked at it because I, I tend to study uh, primates <laughs> and human evolution and things like that. Um, but that being said, the literature on, on chirality in, in prebiotic, prebiotic earth, um, there's so much out there and there's been quite a bit proposed on, on the subject. I, I would say uh, the idea that this is a, a big mystery is not an honest characterization of the problem. It's more so what, like I said earlier, what are the details? Yeah. Can we narrow it down? I think one, one thing I would also like to say is um, if you're a, say, young earth creationist who denies that, say, humans are apes or something like that, and you think that your best argument is abiogenesis, here's a spoiler alert. Even if abiogenesis were some miracle, you're still an ape. Yep. Common ancestry still remains true because those aren't the same question. So a lot of creationists like to pretend that if they can show that abiogenesis couldn't happen, that that would invalidate the rest of science, I guess, because I was gonna say the rest of evolution, but that isn't part, even part of evolution. And so it's this very frustrating tactic where Creationists will try to attack one part of science that currently has some open questions and pretend that that would knock down all the rest of science, which is not how it works. Absolutely. And it should be very telling that so much of the argument from, from the side of kind of a creationist apologists is coming from origins or busts. It's, it's all coming down to abiogenesis because they're still trying to find this, uh, this, this last large problem, quote unquote, something that isn't as sussed out as evolutionary theory or um, the, the common ancestry of life. So they go from, ah, uh, all life isn't related to, well, it can't be if you can't show that it can, it can generate from quote unquote nothing. Um, not like that per se, none of that matters. If, if there was a deity who spurred abiogenesis, that would change none of the facts that the earth is very ancient, uh, and that we are indeed apes who have descended from other apes in an unbroken chain all the way back to the common ancestor of all life. Uh, that, that would not impact it. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, we have one question, we have one hand raised. Um, uh, Donald Cornus, you may unmute yourself. <coughs> Thanks. Um... Yeah, I guess I can't turn my camera on. I, I'm, I've, I've had problems with, with Zoom in the past. This is the first time I think I've ever really had it working right. So I'm learning this as I go. Uh, <laughs> any rate, um, oh, you had asked uh, if, if anyone wanted to, to address a particular question way back when, and now I kind of forgot what the whole question was. But I, I did want to say a little bit about evolution if it's okay and the, i noticed the title of this thing as as i understand it was uh um creation creationism evolves um oh start the video okay so i guess i've got my video going uh i don't know if i got that title right but um this is something i just recently was in a debate about of uh you know whether evolution is ubiquitous and uh uh, part of my argument in that debate is that evolution of various forms are is ubiquitous. That that evolution is all around us, and not just biological evolution, but uh, linguistic evolution, cultural evolution, 
um, all kinds of evolution. And yes, uh, creationism has evolved. Religions evolve. Cults, for that matter, tend to evolve. Uh, you know, um, they such things tend to resist evolving. But then again, uh, you know, that makes a lot of sense because, uh, you know, resisting change is a good way to maintain some la some level of stability and not go extinct too quickly. Uh, you know, uh, we see a lot of that in, in life where there's resistance to uh, change, where something is stable enough and, and uh, fit enough for its environment that it doesn't really need to change. And sure, change is still going to happen. Um, but we get a certain amount of resistance to change. And, uh, you know, that, that um, sometimes we'll, we'll get a bit of stability. And, and uh, <clears throat> then, of course, if, uh, if the environment changes and um, becomes less suitable for, for the vast majority of a population, um, the vast majority of the population might not do as well as some fringe group within the population that maybe has a trait that's better suited for that environment. And this is something a lot of people don't understand about biological evolution is that it's, it's not a matter of, you know, that when a trait is needed, uh, the genes will then come around for that trait to happen. It's more a matter of there is diversity within a population. And if a particular trait is beneficial uh, to some change in the environment, you know, that works better in that, that particular new environment, um, that, that particular trait will become more prevalent as a result of it. It's just natural selection acting on what happens to be there. So is that helpful at all? I mean, it wasn't what I was originally raising my hand for, but I, I hope I've contributed something useful. <laughs> um, okay, thank, thank you, Donald. Uh, do you have uh, comments on that, everyone? I mean, it certainly, it certainly is the case that things uh, you know, many things change over time. Religions do, in fact, change. Um, I don't know how useful it is to connect it to biological evolution since the mechanisms are somewhat different. There are some commonalities, though. Um, you know, you have this, uh, the idea of, um, like, uh, that Dawkins had with memes, right, where there are ideas that have to uh, sort of, quote, unquote, mutate in order to spread to new minds and to spread throughout the population of minds that can host them. Um, although, in general, I I am hesitant to use the word evolution in a scientific sense outside of common descent and the mechanisms of the generation of biological diversity. And that's all I have. Okay. Uh, Alex, do you want to read out a few of the questions? And, uh, uh, yeah. Um, some of the questions from this chat and then after that we can hit some of the ones from YouTube. Um, David Ornstein asked, uh, could we not call creationism or intelligent design one of the oldest uh, conspiracy theories? Do you guys have any takes on that? I, I, think, I think calling young earth creationism a conspiracy theory is certainly accurate in some senses. Um, and typically I tend to link the two when you see, um, you know, creationists tend to have this idea that it's like, ah, yes, you know, um, it's just big science keeping us down, right? Like you've got uh, AIG and ICR and the Discovery Institute, all of these, you know, pop-up organizations with their uh, their scientists, quote unquote, right? And they are they are scientists, right? Um, but interestingly enough, a quite a quite a large um, number of these scientists do conventional work outside of young earth creationism. Andrew Snelling comes to mind, a geologist who works for AIG, but when he's doing his conventional work, boy, those millions of years sure do start to stack up. Um, but there's this idea that, that science is against creationism. Ah, the, 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 you know, David and Goliath story. That's not how peer review works and that's not how the scientific community works. It, it's very, very easy for anyone with an idea to put it forth for peer review in any given journal. All you have to do is, you know, I'm, I'm writing my thesis right now and I have to abide by uh, journal criteria when I'm submitting it because the hope is that I'll submit it to a journal after um, after applying for this uh, this master's credential, right? And uh, meeting that criteria just isn't that difficult. It's basically um, formatting stuff. So you get guys at AIG and ICR and Discovery Institute who are coming up with these papers in their own creationist journals instead of submitting them for peer review in legitimate journals. 
uh, where people can critique their ideas. And the reason is very simple. It's because folks like myself and Jackson and Dapper who aren't PhDs can put a slight amount of effort into researching these, these uh, journals that are posited in answers research, et cetera, and find glaring holes in them. Issues like Dapper mentioned in methodology with Mark Armitage and his supposed triceratops horn. Um, and it's very interesting when you compare them side by side, like I mentioned Andrew Snell, and if you look at his conventional geology work versus his creationism work, it looks like they're written by two different people. The standards are just vastly different. Um, and so I think the conspiracy that that big science is keeping creationism down because they hate God or something is in, insane and does indeed, at least in that light, put it in a conspiratorial um, in a conspiratorial shelf kind of. Yeah. And also I, a lot of the objections that get raised by creationists to things like radiometric dating or, uh, you know, relative dating of fossils or, you know, uh, reconstructing uh, paleogenomics and things like that are things that if these were actual objections would be so glaringly obvious to even laymen that it's like, do you really, like, how can you think that scientists didn't think of this without it being a conspiracy, right? If it were actually a, a big defeater for radiometric dating that you had to know the initial parent and daughter uh, isotope radi ratios and you couldn't, like, yeah, yeah, we would have noticed that that was a problem if this had been some insurmountable obstacle. And it just wasn't. Or if it's like, oh, hey, we noticed that shale can be sometimes deposited rapidly. It's like, okay, but sometimes it isn't and we know how to tell the difference. So again, you haven't defeated anything. Um, and yeah, so it's really hard to see how you could think seriously about the scientific um, community, be a young earth creationist and not come to the conclusion that they're to some degree conspiring against creationists, which they really aren't. Yeah, and I would say it's somewhat similar to how outside of the like creationism sphere, somewhat of like a victim complex where you have movies like God's Not Dead, where I think the antagonist is like, believes in God, but hates him. And a very, a very strange. Yes. And then the happy ending is that he dies in a car crash, but he, he decides he doesn't hate God anymore right before he dies. <laughs> that is the happy ending. It's, it's inconceivable to these folks that creationism is, is not accepted because it has no support, right? Like it, 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 this doesn't cross, I'm sure, some folks' minds. And, you know, there's concern, at least on my end, that for others, uh, they know exactly what they're doing. Oh, definitely. Especially some of the professional creations I know know better. Snelling knows better. Uh, you know, most of the PhDs, at, I think all the PhDs at AIG know better. I think Kent Hoban knows better. Um, I don't think he's particularly intelligent in terms of science, but I do think he knows better. Um, and yeah, so I, I think most of these people are here. If there is in fact a conspiracy to fool people, it's on the behalf of professional creationists who are trying to basically just bilk people out of money. And perhaps secondarily also, they think it might be increasing the fervency of Christianity, even though I think that it's probably a net loss for Christianity to, to have young earth creationists running around saying that they represent the true Christian interpretation of the Bible. Okay, uh, another wanna... question. Yeah. Oh, sorry, Sohan? No, no, go ahead. Um, there's a question from Eric H. Um, how do you maintain your patience and composure when debating young earth creationists? Uh, I'd imagine it might be frustrating to hear so much pseudoscience, especially from someone who has so much expertise. Yeah, I, I, I can weigh in on that one. I mean, I think the, so when I'm chatting with creationists, I, I tend to try to I tend to think of it like I'm talking more to the audience than, than to the creationists that I'm speaking with. Uh, but that being said, I try I try to assume good faith with with my interlocutor whenever whenever I'm debating creationists. And you know, nine times out of ten, I have a great time. And and the person who I'm debating is a fine person. It's they just hold incorrect beliefs or unsupported beliefs. Um, so my my hope is always that when I'm having these discussions that someone somewhere is going to get something out of it. And even if it's frustrating for me in the moment, at the very least, 
it, it should be elucidating, um, you know, if, if whether they're you know, repeating the same thing over and over again, that, that should be kind of a, a, a red flag for folks who are watching. Um, or if it goes really well and, and they learn something and maybe I learn something about their perspective uh, and, and people who are watching learn too. So I, I, try to, I try to frame it in a way that's like a very optimistic and, uh, and that tends to keep the, the frustration at bay. But there, yeah, there are certainly times where I'm just like, wow, this is uh this is a rough one. <laughs> I'm sure Dapper can relate. Oh yeah, um I've had some pretty rough discussions. Uh Otangelo Grasso and uh Mr. Batman come up as uh, two prime examples of times when it was very hard to stay patient. Um I think my patience in large part comes uh honestly from my time in the Navy where uh I had to be patient with a lot of stuff that's worse than a lot of this putting up with hearing all this nonsense from creationists. So I managed to not snap then. So if I if I can make it through that, I can make it through, you know, someone flatly contradicting themselves within the same sentence and then claiming to be the person with superior scientific knowledge. So yeah, yeah. Uh, it's it's not easy, but it's it's a skill. You have to practice it, and I got a lot of practice. So yeah, absolutely. Was, were there was there another uh, question? Uh, yeah, uh, Alex, do you wanna? Ask the next question. Oh, sure. We can uh, read out some of the ones from YouTube. Um, let's see. And then we'll address some of the people who have their hands raised after that. Mm -hmm. um, how do ERVs occur if viruses only infect us for a short time? Okay. So um, an ERV, in case there's anyone who doesn't know, uh, is an endogenous retrovirus. So retroviruses are a particular group of viruses. Most viruses simply insert their genetic material into the cell and then directly hijack the ribosomes to create the proteins that the virus needs to create new uh, viral particles. ERVs are a little bit sneaky. They actually have this uh, particular protein called reverse transcriptase, which takes the viral genetic material and transcribes it into the host's nuclear DNA. Now, <clears throat> what usually happens is that infected cells will then start producing viral particles, eventually die, and the viral particles will spread to new cells. However, sometimes something can happen where for some reason that particular cell isn't actually going to end up transcribing the viral genetic code and start producing the viral uh, proteins. This could be something like um, a, a chain or sorry, a mistake or something, a mutation in the transcription during reverse transcription. It could simply be that the location that um, in the genome that the ERV has uh, inserted into has perhaps become a methylation target and therefore it's unlikely to be uh, transcribed. There are also defense mechanisms that cells have against uh, ER or retroviruses. And so an ERV can pass down genetically if an, a retrovirus infects a germline cell and the virus essentially breaks in one of those ways. And then that's, that gamete goes on to produce an off, you know, goes on to produce offspring. So whether it be a spermatozoa or an ova, it then, you know, becomes a new uh, member of the population which then goes on to reproduce and spreads that now broken uh, retrovirus throughout the population. So the key thing is it has to break and it has to break in a uh, germline cell and it has to break in a germline cell that then goes on to actually be fertilized or to fertilize. I think too, an interesting thing about uh, ERVs is that, you know, how, how do we know that they're, that they're viruses? How do we know that these are ancient incorporated viruses? And uh, that's, th that's something that I hear quite frequently from, from creationists is they'll say, well, you know, since they can help, they don't always hurt. So since they can help, they must be designed parts of the DNA. Therefore, they can't be viruses because, you know, that would violate the and it was good part of Genesis, I suppose. Uh, but the interesting thing about ERVs is that you can xenotransplant them and they will behave like viruses again. So if you take, for instance, a, a pig uh, ERV and transplant it into a mouse, it will start behaving as a virus does once more. There's, there's been some really cool work on this. Uh, so yeah, we know for sure that, that these are uh, incorporated bits of, of viral um, genetic material. That's, that's not up for debate. And um, they can do good things. I believe 8% of our of our uh, genome is, is ERV, some, something like that. You can correct me if I'm wrong, Dapper. Um, I'm not sure about the percentage. I do know that uh, some of the genes that are very important in immunosuppression around the placenta in uh, yeah. female placental mammals, you know, reproduction that's are... That or derives from ERV genes. Right. They're not all functional though. Don't don't be don't be doing yeah, the vast majority do nothing because they're yeah, just broken viruses. Yeah, 
Yes. We were talking uh, just last night about um, the one uh, ARC, ARC slash ARG uh, 3.1, which is involved in, in uh, shuttling materials across neurons, which is involved in uh, the formation of long-term memory. Yeah. Right. So that's, it's, it forms a little protein shell like a virus because it's the remains of a virus. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Sorry, go ahead. No, I, I was just agreeing, saying yes, absolutely. Okay. Uh, I think uh, Aaron Lane has had their hand up for a while. So, um, uh, you may unmute yourself, Aaron. Uh, thank you. I, uh, uh, my question is somewhat simple, and I suspect I already know the host's answers. What's your thought on creationists like Nathaniel Jameson, who has been leading this kind of movement on creationism has always accepted speciation and nested hierarchies. When you look at Gish 20, 25 years ago, who was saying these things never happen. Oh, it's, it's, it's all completely um, like ad hoc reasoning, right? Or, or post hoc, ad hoc, post hoc. I, I don't know my, my term. It's both. It's both. Okay, good. Well, yeah, it's, 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 it's all bogus. It's all retroactive, right? I mean, you can, you can look at any of this literature, and and these guys are just railing, railing, railing against speciation for decades and decades and decades. Um, so, so this is very—it's very funny to me, and I'm sure the other panelists as well. When people bring up this idea uh, that guys like Nathaniel Jensen, who is a guy who works for uh, Answers in Gen uh, Answers in Genesis, almost said Answers in Genetics, which is a better name. He has none of those. <laughs> yeah, he he works he works for AIG, and he you know is the guy who's coming out with ah oh, yes, look at all my predictions for why Jensen makes predictions. Jensen makes predictions, right? Or or the mitochondrial DNA and stuff like that, and. Uh, like Jackson says, it's it's all bogus, all, all of it. Um, yeah, his his rates are they're bonkers. They they don't work. They're they're pedigree rates that are taken from a poor study, um, uh, Parsons et al. And uh, it takes into account nothing with regard to phylogenetic rates. And, and I could go on and on and on, but there's plenty. Uh, if I may, Dan Stern Cardinal has gone into a lot of detail both on Reddit and on YouTube on this. Yeah, mm -hmm. this is his uh, is his YouTube channel. Yeah. yeah. But, um, one, oh, go ahead, go. one thing I would like to say about the, the history of creationism is that um, basically creationism is in the position where it essentially rejects as much as it can, but there are some things that it knows that even the, their sympathetic audiences simply won't buy into. And so speciation is one of these things. In the 70s, you could get away with telling people in churches who were already very primed to believe you that speciation wasn't occurring. But now it's a thing that occur we've seen occur multiple times in history in real time and so at this point they're just like well i mean we just can't keep up that facade anymore and so <clears throat> but then they'll say that oh no this has never really been a thing that we were objecting to and it's it's just sort of like like newspeak right you know the has has the country always been at war in africa or in asia i can't remember it's always been one of them and it's never been the other even when it changes gestures to george mccready price <laughs> yeah <clears throat> and so it's you've got this new think kind of thing going on where you you just pretend that the current position of young earth creationism has always been the position like if you read flood geology they come like from uh, morris back in the 70s completely rejects plate tectonics absolutely yep. no time for it now there's like they're so into plate tectonics that they think that the plates can zoom around at, you know 80 miles an hour which no, no, they can't. Another another really classic example of the new speak for creationists is you'll hear guys like Nathaniel Jensen or Jensenites, folks who are very into into his work, talk about how creationism has always predicted transitional species because humans are created in the image of God and we design amphibious vehicles, which are like a transition between a boat and a car. Uh, yeah. And if that sounds absolutely insane, it's because it is. Yep. It, read, I have not heard before in Daniel Jameson of a single creationist who would even like, like transitional species is like a swear word for these guys. They're allergic to it. So now they're coming around saying, ah, pff, no, we always, we were always cool with it. Trust me, you know, and it's, it's, it's absurd, let, let alone the fact that, you know, in, since genetics uh, and, and DNA necessitates heredity, right? Like we know that this is, 
you know, the DNA is essentially the, the currency of relatedness, right? Um, there, there's, there's no way to explain this nested hierarchy within the creationist worldview. Where does the line stop? If you're related to your dad by genomic comparison, why wouldn't you be re related to a chimp by that same metric if they use that, that method for mice and rats or uh, dogs and um, wolves, right? So. And uh, interestingly, the, yeah, we, oh. Oh, the difference between mice and rats is way bigger than humans and chimps. Way bigger, yeah. And, and most creationists accept mice and rats as being actually related through ancestry, but humans and chimps, no, that's a, that's a boat too far, despite the fact that they're radically more similar. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, it, it's, it's also funny that they're still producing literature this very year, which says there are no transitional fossils. Like, you can go to any of their, go to AIG, ICR, CMI, you will find an article written this year where they're still saying transitional fossils don't exist. It's, they're, they're talking out of both sides. Yeah, they, don't, yeah. they don't agree with each other. And Dapper and I both, in, in our presentations, kind of covered a little bit of that. Dapper with the with the seminars on, uh, you know, did our birds, rather, who was um, Michael <laughs> Dapper? Was Michael and they were sequential seminars. It was one right after the other. I couldn't believe it. Yeah, it's, it's the same thing with the hominids, like, or, and the hominids, rather. Um, you know, they'll, they'll, you'll get 10 creationists and show them, you know, an australopithecine. Half of them will say it's a human. Half of them will say it's an ape. Um, of course, <laughs> you know, you, you, you just can't get consistency out of these guys. Don't forget about the occasional one who said that it's not even a real taxon. It's just oh, a jumble yeah. of random bones oh, that you've been assorted damn. by, by yeah, they, those paleo yeah. experts. Yeah, the, the, the funny thing is I want to take the opportunity uh, to, to touch on that very briefly because contested bones, which I touched on in my, uh, in my opener, is uh, the, the creationist handbook these days for human evolution. You know, they'll, they'll whip it out and, you know, thumb through the pages until they can find something to say on the hominin in question. And uh, these guys will look at the likes of uh, Australopithecus viva or Homo habilis, Homo gautengensis, uh, and Homo rudolfensis, all taxa which imperatively link the Australopithecines to, to genus Homo as far as this gradient of traits. And they'll say, they're just too perfect, right? They've got to be mixtures of Australopith bones and human bones, quote unquote. And yet you can show them a picture of MH1 and MH2, the Malapa hominins, where they're found in partial articulation. So these guys, Christopher, and I'm pointing this way because I have their book on my floor, um, which I've unfortunately read, I've put myself through that. Uh, but they'll say something like, Australopithecus sediba is a wastebasket taxon. It's a mix of human and, and Australopith bones. Uh, it, it can't be legitimate. And then you'll pull up a picture that has the, the forearm, uh, the upper arm and the shoulder linked together uh, as well as, you know, bits of the jaw and the skull. And they'll say, well, just because you found them in articulation doesn't mean that they're from the same species. You'll find the jaw and the skull in articulation with one another. They'll say one's from an australopith, the other's from a human. Supposing what? That you've got a human and an australopith running at top speed at one another, colliding and then fossilizing instantly. It's, it's bonkers. Maybe it was just a human who was playing a really gruesome game of like, put the puzzle back together with right. some human yeah. and australopithecine bones. I mean, I guess that's an option, but... Um, I mean, they're, they're just mineralized bone in articulation. It's, it's and, and they have wear patterns on the bones that prove that they're actually from the same individual because yeah. the wear patterns line up. Point articular surfaces, yeah. Yeah, so it's... There is actually no option other than that this is a single animal that you're finding. Yeah, it's you, just, no. You, 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 we're using methods that are more sophisticated than we use in human forensics to tell whether two bones came from the same individual. Like, and this is, it's, it's unequivocal. Unequivocal? Whatever. All right. Uh, yeah, unequivocal. Yeah, I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, thank, thanks for that answer. And uh, we have a couple of hands raised and a couple of, uh, and a YouTube question. Um, we have another, we have a hand raised here. Uh, Donald, do you want to ask your question quickly? Okay. Yeah, I guess I'm unmuted now. And, um, oh, the video is disabled again. That's all right. Any rate, um, <clears throat> yeah. Oh, there it is. Is it working? Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, uh, what I was saying last time, I'm not sure who it was who responded, uh, uh, but somebody had responded and said they're, they're not sure they would call that evolution because it's not biological evolution. I would like to, you know, bring up an analogy to that. You know, would you, would you not call a boat or a bicycle transportation because it's not four-wheeled vehicular transportation like you'd expect to see on a freeway? 
Uh, you know, I mean, there are reasons why we use qualifier words like biological. And I understand that in the field of biology, the word biological gets left out when people are talking about biological evolution. The same way as when people, you know, are talking in the field of, of uh, computers, they leave out the word computer when they're talking about computer programming quite often. And they just talk, call it programming. But if you're programming something other than a computer, it's still programming. Just because it's not computer programming doesn't mean it's not programming. And just because evolution, for example, the evolution of creationism is not biological evolution doesn't mean it's not evolution. It follows the same rules of evolution that any other evolution does, which is uh, that, you know, in order to evolve, changes have to add up. Now, um, non-biological evolution does not have to follow the rules of biology, so, you know, if you're talking about a theory of biological evolution, or you're talking about the specific uh, things that you would expect to find when things biologically evolve, sure, you might find some things that you're not going to find in certain kinds of non-biological evolution, but you will also find overlap. Uh, there are a lot of things that happen in biological evolution that will happen in a lot of other biological evolution, uh, in a, a lot of non-biological evolution because there's overlap in how certain things work. I mean, biology, for example, is, uh, is a subset of biochemistry, which is a subset of physics. And uh, anything that reproduces, of course, can have reproductive evolution, regardless whether it's biological or not. For example, computer programs, uh, if, you, if you branch off, say you're working on some, some open source computer program, and you branch it off and you make another branch, well, that, that's reproduction. And the evolution of that computer program, as it continues to be developed along multiple branches, is a branching reproductive evolution, just like you find in biology, and it follows the same kinds of rules. So um, I would, you know, I would, I understand that some people don't want to call evolution evolution unless it's biological evolution. Uh, but I think the smarter way to handle that when it comes to, you know, outside of that particular field, when you're talking to people who are not experts in biology, is to, is to, to when you mean biological evolution, say biological evolution. And if you, you know, if, if somebody brings up evolution of another kind and you don't know enough about that kind of evolution, admit it. Just say, you know, I don't know enough about that to talk about that. Um, but, you know, yeah. don't call it... Don't say it's not evolution just because it's not biological is my point. Um, would, would, the, would any of the panelists agree with me that, you know, um, that evolution outside of biology is still evolution? Or do you think we need another name for uh, the accumulation of change when it's not happening in biology? Uh, my, my only statement on it is that I, I, I don't really have a horse in this race, but I, I would simply say that usually this is something that's contextual. So like usually it's just like the, the area of conversation or the, the um, type of conversation that you're having is typically going to give you a clue as to like what, what, which one you're talking about. Uh, but that's, that's what I said. Yeah. yeah. It, it, yes. I think the issue, and I, I agree with that. It, it is contextual, but also I, I think the issue yes, can be if too. you're having this conversation with a creationist say and they're talking about you know like kent hoven's six types of evolution and he's trying to meld these all together into one meta narrative and he's like well if you can't demonstrate one of these the whole thing falls apart when if we're having if i'm having a discussion about evolution i'm not going to talk about the origin of the solar system or the origin of life even i'm just going to talk about luca onwards that's it if, if the the rest of it i think yes should there are oh, own separate conversations. All right, we have a quick we have a quick question from the chat. Um, what? Yeah, it's a pretty broad question. Uh, what do you think is the future of creationism? I mean, I'd like to say that it's on its last leg, but it's it's really not. Um, what I am seeing right now, uh, with in terms of like shifts in creationist thinking, is um, diving really well into what looks like depth on things like uh, biochemistry, but actually ignoring the scientific uh, literature on it and simply going into, well, if we can say a lot of really big words and give a, at least superficially detailed seeming description of some complicated biochemical pathway, like, uh, I don't know, like photosynthesis or something, and then say, oh, look, that's really neat. Therefore it must've been designed um, because I mean, 
even creationists are starting to notice a lot of the arguments they've been making just aren't working all that well. And so I think they're diving into areas where the average lay person who is a creationist, not necessarily a professional creationist, but, you know, it's just someone who they go to church each Sunday and they don't really think about this too much. <clears throat> but if they can go into areas that just sound really complicated, then that it's just going to you know blow that person away. Like, I have no idea what's going on. This guy sounds really smart. He must be right. Um, and so it basically, it, I think it's just going into just baffle them with big words is a, is a lot of the shifts I'm seeing. I see that a lot on YouTube. Um, although I do think that groups like uh, AIG, uh, Estrus of Genesis, Creation Industries International, uh, I still do think they're going to keep producing stuff about, you know, the arc and pretending that there are no problems with that, even though there are essentially infinite insurmountable problems with the arc. Uh, so I think it's going to be, there's going to be that two pronged approach where you're going to have some of them who are going to go into really weird technical jargon that doesn't actually make sense, but you're still going to keep getting that same stuff where it's like, Hey, come see our dinosaur sculptures here at the Ark encounter. Isn't that I, neat? I think too, a, a really big, a really big one that I'm seeing from, from the insurmountable problems that Dapper just mentioned because young Earth, so young Earth career system requires a global flood. Uh, this, this is just like a thing that it requires. And that global flood really screws them over. That global flood is is like a, a hurdle that creationists just can't make. And it's because to, to get that global flood, to have that global flood, you require physics breaking at every single level. Um, and the big one is that there's a massive problem with the amount of heat. Uh, to accelerate all that rate <clears throat> within a time span of one year, to move all the continents around from the, the Pangaea or Rodinia, depending on the mood of the creationist you're talking to, um, into their current formation uh, to get all that rock to harden and lay down. I, I mean, the lithification alone is, is massive amounts of heat. They have to have all the impacts that have ever occurred, impact events from asteroids and the like, uh, that have ever occurred on this planet occur during that time span to account for cratering within the layers. Um, it, it's it's heat to the level of, I think the number is like 100, or sorry, 1,000 trillion one megaton H-bombs. It's so much heat. And so my thinking is that their answer to this is going to perpetually be, we're working on it. Uh, that's what I think we'll see for, from creationism. I think the future of it is going to be, well, we're trying to figure it out. In the meantime, come visit our ARC park, come see our museum, buy our merchandise, whatever, uh, and continue to support us financially uh, and buy into what we're talking about because uh, you're not a real Christian if you don't accept young earth creationism. It's those two things is what they push working on the science, but also if you don't believe like us, then you know, you're, you're screwed totally. And, and that's, they'll ride that horse all the way to the bank. Um, and that actually brings up a, a, an interesting point. A lot of creationism right now is actually focused at non-creationist Christians in terms of trying to convince people. Yeah. I think I think groups like uh, Gen Answers in Genesis and whatnot have mostly given up on the idea that they're going to get non-Christians to convert to Christianity by telling them about creationism. Now they have to keep up the facade that that's what they're doing. So, you know, they're like, oh, hey, bring your atheist friends or something to have a talk at, you know, the Ark Encounter or Dinosaur, or dinosaur Adventure Line or something. But if when you actually look at, like, the sort of commercials that go on at the beginning and usually the end of every, like, Answers in Genesis thing, one of the things they really harp on about is Christians who are, you know, accepting the way of the, you know, worldly science or something and how we need to get them back on to the real truth of the gospel. And so I think a lot of creationism is going to increasingly become sort of a, a rear guard defense where it's just like, we have to hold on to as many of the kids as we can. Cause yeah. you're, you're just not getting a lot of new adult converts with, uh, with regard. You mentioned earlier that there, some of them are going to be moving into like weird areas. I think yes and no. I think a lot of their old arguments are just going to cycle for eternity. Mm -hmm. um, like for instance, if, sometimes when you check the, um, the answers in Genesis homepage, they put up an article about the bombardier beetle. Uh, you know, the, the old oh goodness, the, yeah. that old chestnut where Gish claimed, well, if you combine the two chemicals, uh, and I don't remember what they are, it's a quinone and something else. Um, but if you combine them outside of uh, outside of that um, environment, they'll explode when they don't. You know, things like yeah, that. Yeah, it needs and, an enzyme in order to catalyze a reaction to an explosive level. And, and so it, it's just, it's ridiculous it's just absolutely ridiculous but they're, they're never going to give it up i uh, i thought so. you were going that way with the uh the other Dwayne gish thing from his masterpiece dinosaurs by design oh you goodness <laughs> may have used bombardier beetle chemicals 
in its crest in order to breathe fire. And that's why people uh, who think that dragons existed were actually talking about dinosaurs. It, it just, I like the, to think it just level... had bombardier beetles inside of its crest. And yeah. it just crawled down to the edge of its nose and squirted out the actual chemical. I mean, the level of like lack of anatomy that you have to have to even think that that is potentially feasible is absurd. Yeah. But it, the thing is freaking fire coming out of an organism. But, but Jackson, remember, it wasn't that long ago that Jonathan Sarfati challenged all of us to produce a single animal with an open acetabulum and feathers, which is literally every bird. And he did not realize that. That's, no. And he wrote a book trying to dispute the, you know, dinosaurian nature of birds. And he oh, wow. didn't even know what a bird pelvis looks like. Well, that's like, that's like um, that guy that um, was it like uh, Jeff... Was it Simmons or Simons that uh, PZ Myers debated way back on like a radio show where uh, this guy wrote this whole book on billions of missing links. And he's like, oh, there are no whale transitional fossils whatsoever. And PZ's like, what about Pachycetus and Ambulocetus? And the guy literally says, what is that? You got to love it. Oh, goodness. Yeah. Like, OK, all right, well, we're done then, you know? <laughs> Jeffrey Simmons, yeah, yeah. Uh, that 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 reminds me too of when uh, Prothero debated Gish, uh, and yep. uh, Prothero brought up the uh, uh, Ceratopsian um, uh, links missing transitional species, which are pr amazingly all, uh, good. There's yeah. such a great fossil very record for well them. Yeah, very well represented. And uh, and and he, I believe Prothero, Do uh, um, Donald Prothero, yes. Mm -hmm. well, yeah, I believe he at the end of his presentation was essentially like, I I can almost guarantee you that this is going to be back the next time saying the same thing about how there aren't any, um, you know, Ceratopsian uh, transitions in the lineage. Sure enough, the, he attended the next lecture that Gish was at and he was there repeating the same claims despite being corrected on them. So, yeah. Same, same, you know, same stuff. And that's, that's the kind of behavior that makes me think that most of the professionals know better. They know that they're lying to you. It's, yeah, it's concerning. Well, it's, it's more important to get converts than, you know, be right about science because ultimately your soul is at stake and that's what ultimately matters. So we have a question from Jim Majors. Uh, Jim, would you please unmute yourself? Yeah. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Totally. Okay. Uh, I just uh, want to add real quick. Uh, yeah, it's along the lines of uh, Bobby Boucher's biological arguments. You know, uh, mom says that alligators are so bad because they got all them teeth and no toothbrush. <laughs> you know, uh, no, but I wondered if you guys could speak on uh, the the utility of uh, uh, the, the reduction of all species to a bottleneck of, of two uh, and then the genetic implications of that. Oh, oh, my gosh, it's 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 bonkers. The, the idea that you're going, look, we're seeing this in real time with, with sadly a great many species in, in our world today. It was the, the North African uh, white rhino was experiencing this several years ago when the last male died. Um, and they declared this animal functionally extinct when there were still two dozen or so individuals left. This is because genetic diversity simply cannot recover from when you, once you reach certain levels. Yeah. Um, now, there, there are slight exceptions to the rule if the individuals are very, very distantly related uh, by you know, sure chance. The Heinen gibbons are, um, of Heinen Island are, are a case of this, right? You've got these, put this population of, of Heinen gibbons of approximately 30. Um, and fortunately, they were two family groups that for whatever reason were from opposite sides of the island. So there is a chance that they might not be functionally extinct with the massive asterisk that if any kind of illness that they're susceptible to pops up in the future, they're all toast because they've got no diversity to, to, to protect themselves from it. Um, a, a bottleneck of two is, is so untenable that creationists have had to come up with workarounds for it. And, and the, the term that you hear thrown around these days in these circles is to create heterozygosity which yeah. we here, the three of us have dealt quite a bit with. It's this idea that uh, God front loaded them with diversity so that when they eventually got down to a bottleneck of two, they could recover from it. Um, of course, it, within the chiropterans alone, the bats, it, it, we're talking a genome thousands upon thousands upon thousands of times larger than it currently is, which is not biologically possible. So, so you can't cram that diversity in, uh, in, in a front loading method um, 
And and if you're not going to invoke some kind of miraculous thing like that, it's not doable. Everything would be inbred to to you know to hell and back. It, it would not be. We wouldn't see the diversity. Yeah. And one thing I would like to say, and this kind of ties into the fact that I do do a bit of history here and there. Um, a lot of times creationists will try to say, oh, well, you know, we have 4,400 4, years or so because they put the, the arc at about 4,400 years before present. So we have that much time to get from <clears throat> basically two individuals of each family level taxon, which I don't even want to get into right now. The fact that the family doesn't really mean anything biologically, like to any two families are not equivalent size taxa. They're, it's just arbitrary. But anyway, that's what they like to do. And then they'll say, oh, we have, you know, 4,400 years to get to about modern biodiversity. But the problem is we have, you know, actual discussions and depictions of known modern individ individual species in ancient art. So like, for instance, we know that in ancient Egypt, you know, basically all the major felid species were already there that are currently in the area. All the major birds of prey, we know about numerous different kinds of waterfowl, herons, all of these things. And we know that the Romans were distinguishing between different kinds of whales that they were hunting in the Mediterranean Sea. So we know that basically you've got a couple hundred years maybe to get from this radical reduction in biodiversity in every family taxon to current, not just species diversity, but you're going to have to get pretty close to right now, just complete genetic diversity. And it requires a mutation rate that is absolutely insane, just many orders of magnitude higher than what we observe now. And also, I mean, how is selection going to affect this? You're going to have to get multiple, multiple mutations on every single offspring. And there's no way to guarantee that with this many mutations, other than a miracle, I suppose, you're not going to introduce a whole bunch of lethal mutations, which are more common than beneficial ones. Yeah, it, it's also, it's, there's another really major problem that they have, and that's they have to compare booking the arc with how much uh, um, again. Okay. Can you guys hear me? Yes, you're good now. Okay. All right. Um, yeah. So there's a, a, a problem with booking the arc versus how much evolution or not evolution has to occur afterwards. So the more, or you can have less evolution by having much smaller kinds on the arc. You could have it to where every single species is its own kind, but then you've got millions and millions and millions of species on the arc. Or you could flip that and you could have maybe a couple thousand. Um, and they vary tremendously in how many kinds there would have been on the arc. Um, the AG likes to go with like 7,000 ish. Yeah, which you know, they can also say, oh, well, maybe it was, what was it, just about like 1,500 or so at one time? Wasn't that it? I, I think that might have been an estimate, but I, I well, think most of them have realized that's really small. You're yeah, to regardless, allow for a lot of evolution. Yeah, regardless, it, it's yeah. So the fewer you have, though, the fewer kinds, the more evolution has to occur afterwards. So either way, you're stuck in a they're stuck in a problem of their own making, right. and they can't get out of it. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> oh yeah, and that's that's too uh, uh, the funny thing about the creationists that talk about okay, how many kinds are there is that there's such an incredible bias against or rather towards extant life and like dinosaurs. Like they, mm -hmm. they don't seem to care at all about the organisms that lived from the Carboniferous all the way up through the Triassic. These mm -hmm. animals are forgotten by the wayside. All the Pseudosuchians, any kind of synapsid that was tromping around during the Permian. And, um, and we're talking periods where biodiversity was equally as high, if not higher uh, than it is you know, today. In hey, even... You don't even have to go back to the Mesozoic, even in the Cenozoic. I mean, find me the cre young Earth creationist who knows to put, say, planocranids or brontotheres on the Ark. They don't. No, creationists have never heard about planocranids, which, you know, in case people don't know, are some really cool crocodilians who ran around on land and, you know, might have even run on hooves to chase down their land-based prey. And they were around in Cenozoic and, like, yeah, even in that that case, they, they don't know. They're like cramming Paraceratherium on the ark. <laughs> yeah, what right, was the ancestral or what, what was the ancestral rhinoceros? Was it you know Hyracius? Uh, well, what about the ancestral horse and the ancestral tapirs? These all look very similar. They're <laughs> Why like are almost they identical. identical? <laughs> <laughs> you know, 
Yeah. Why not just have an ancestral perissodactyl or an ancestral ungulate or an ancestral mammal? Or <laughs> they they just brought Luca on the ark. It was just that's human. all you need. Yes, and then they brought Luca. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> all right, we have a. Uh... We have quite a few questions and then some hands. Unfortunately, we won't be able to get to everyone within the formal event, but we encourage um, whoever would like to stay after. We'll just get to a couple more texted questions and then we'll close the event formally. Please stay around if you want to uh, discuss further with us. Um, so we have a question. Are the creationist, I think this is a quick one, are the creationist journals open to anyone to submit to or do they have preordained authors Maybe the panel can slip a real paper to them. I think like something like a so-called type thing. So they generally don't have pre-approved authors, but what they do have in their submission requirements are that they have conclusions you're not allowed to come to. So for instance, um, they'll have things like, oh, this, you, you cannot use, you can't submit any um, papers from an old earth uh, or evolutionist or flat earth perspective. And I'll just say flat out, like, if you come to these conclusions, we will not publish you. Interestingly enough, there was, a, um, I think it was, I think it was Jeffrey Tompkins. I think Jeffrey Tompkins, the guy I was discussing who, who screwed up the, the human chimp comparison uh, through Blast. I think he, if memory serves Glenn Williamson, the guy that discovered that there was a bug in the blast program he was using. And then also once he ran it again without the bug and went from 70 to 80% showed him why he was incorrect there as well. Mm -hmm. um, but I, if memory serves, one of Glenn's papers was like in perpetual peer review because Tompkins was the peer reviewer. He was peer reviewing his own, crit the critique against him, you know? So it was, it was funny to, to, I suppose very slightly AIG's credit, uh, when Tompkins realized it was because of the bug, he, he did come out and was like, ah, oh, yes, okay, well, there is a bug. I guess it's not 70%. Instead, it's 80 or 82 or something like that of, of humans and chimps. Uh, and then when Glenn resubmitted and was like, no, your methodology is still bad, um, he was like, uh, mm, we'll put this one on hold for a while. And I, I think it, to, if memory serves, I, I could be butchering this story when Glenn, Glenn told me this months ago. Uh, but I, I believe it's still being peer reviewed. And this was several years ago. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, they have their, their statement of faith that says anything that disagrees with our young earth interpretation is necessarily wrong. Doesn't matter. It's wrong. Which is, of course, funny. Uh, you know, does nature have a statement of faith? Does PNAS, does science or any of the other mainstream I mean, girls? Uh, it, it's no. not just funny. <laughs> it's not just funny. This is behavior that if any if any serious academic journal had engaged in this, it would be fraud. Yes. This would be academic exactly. fraud. Yes. It's, now, that's not criminal fraud. Like, you're not going to go to jail for it. But if you were trying to do this in a serious academic field, you would essentially have no credibility for the entire rest of your life. Everything you had done up to then would be re-scrutinized, and it would be very hard for you to be taken seriously ever again if you did anything like that. Right. We have a question about... Um... I, th I think th I think this will have to be the last question, and then we have to close the event. But uh, what was the latest young Earth creationist argument you've heard that led you to learn some actual cool new scientific facts? Oh, that's an interesting question. Hmm. Sorry. That is an interesting question. Um, for me, so I, I recently did a video on limestone, and I don't I don't typically go geology, but I've been dipping my toes into geology arguments lately because I think geology is really cool, and I want to learn more about it. Uh, so I was researching limestone, and I learned a lot about how many types there are, how it can form, the fastest and slowest rates that it can form, um, and and it ended in me creating a whole video that was like, yeah, limestone just alone as a single entity precludes young earth creationism. You can't get cliffs like the, like the cliffs of Dover or mountains like Notch Peak, um, which incorporate limestone with dolomite. You, you can't get these kinds of chemical conversions. You can't get it at those heights by the rate that it falls out of the water. You certainly can't get it within the conditions of the flood, but even in perfect conditions during the flood year, you get like two inches of limestone deposition. Um, and it, it was cool because now I, I find myself when I'm walking around, I'm like, ooh, that looks like a limestone formation to me. You know, it's like, I feel like I can identify it and stuff, which of course I probably can't, but 
Um, I learned a lot about it. It's a cool rock. You guys should look into limestone. <laughs> Uh, for me, I definitely have learned a lot more about uh, geology in the uh, past few months. Uh, in large part, I was responding to um, Tasman Walker from Creation Ministries International. But also, um, there have been a lot of discussions about, you know, like uh, ERVs or human chromosome 2 fusion, things like that, where I'm not very well versed on genetics. And so in order to respond to those, I've had to learn a lot more about why do we say that there's a chromosome 2 fusion site? Uh, you know, what, is the, what would we expect to see at a fusion site? Um, there are arguments about like, oh, well, there's a functional gene across that fusion site. So it can't be a fusion site. So I looked into that and, oh, it turns out that gene is usually in a, essentially every other ape actually tied to a telomere region. So it's the exact kind of thing we would expect to see at a fusion site. And so um, I think those two um, just sort of diving even deeper into flood geology uh, in response to various arguments from Tasman Walker, as well as from a lot of uh, creationists going into things about uh, human genetics. Um, I suppose mine is, I, well, before we got to the end, I was just, I thought you were going to ask, what is like the, the newest creationist argument you've heard, um, which I heard the other day from some creationists uh, that um, Charles, was it Charles Doolittle Walcott who discovered the Burgess Shale? He found the shale and then hid all the fossils, <laughs> which is, it's so crazy. I don't I I don't even know where they got it. Like I feel that they got it from somewhere, but I've just never heard that. Um in terms of 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 uh an argument that made me look into some interesting research. Um I was doing uh, research for a debate that <laughs> isn't going to materialize and uh, I came across some <laughs> research on speciation in uh, the bacterium Pseudomonas and uh, there was this now it's a bit older experiment, but it's still very interesting, which they took the pseudomonas and they put it in this, this uh, gel, this medium, whatever. Um, and some of it radiated upwards to where, where uh, it was in this aerobic environment and some radiated downwards to this anaerobic environment. So the middle is sort of facultatively aerobic. Well, as they radiated in both directions, they developed different morphologies and they changed their physiologic systems to deal with how much oxygen was in the environment. And so that was, um, it was actually an older Jonathan Wells argument um, that that's not speciation. He says, uh, kind of looks like it though, in my opinion, but oh well. All right, great. Uh, Alex, you want to, you want to take us out of here? Uh, sure. Yeah. So this was um, some links in the, in the chat. Yeah, this was an incredible event. Thank you. Um, Thank you to the three of you for coming and speaking and answering all these questions. Um, we will be sticking around for a little while afterwards, um, but <clears throat> uh, let's bring this event officially to a close. And for, uh, for the people listening, um, if you're interested in more events like these, or also we have weekly meetups on Thursdays at six o'clock Eastern time, um, you can go to our website ssomit.mit.edu. And you can also check out our various panelists um, on YouTube and um, sometimes other sites. And yeah, thank you all for coming. Thanks for having us. Thanks for having us. Thank you. <laughs>